our lives can be filled with adversity. How we get through and handle adversity really defines who we are. Our guest today on the podcast, we spoke with Fitz Kohler from fitzness.com. This woman is an inspiration and her story is going to help change lives. I love how open and honest Fitz Kohler is about the situation that she went through with breast cancer. One out of eight women are inflicted by this horrible condition, breast cancer. Many of us have dealt with people or somewhere in our lives we've been touched by a person with cancer. So Fitz combats this by writing a book, My Noisy Cancer Comeback, Running at the Mouth While Running for My Life. We all face adversity, but this woman faced adversity, charged into it, and overcame it in a very powerful way. We are delighted that she is here to share her story, and let's not waste any more time and get into it. Hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be around this wild, wacky, and sometimes disturbing world of ours. Yes, that's the intro to the Mindset Podcast, a weekly attempt to open eyes and shedding light on what's really going on in the world, all done by ripping apart the media madness that masquerades as news. Join me, Gareth Davis, every Sunday on the Mindset Podcast. You can find the show on all major podcasting services such as iTunes, Stitcher, and so on. Or you can go directly to the main Mindset website. That's www.mindsetcentral.com. Check out the Mindset Podcast. Bring your curiosity, your opinions, and a sense of humor. And remember that some worldviews are stranger than others. To overcome, you must educate. Educate not only yourself, but educate anyone seeking to learn. We are all dead America. We can all learn something. To learn, we must challenge what we already understand. The way we do that is through conversation. Sometimes we have conversations with others. However, some of the best conversations happen with ourselves. Reach out and challenge yourself. Let's dive in and learn something right now. Today we have a great inspirational story for you. We have Fitz Kohler of Fitzness.com and the author of My Noisy Cancer Comeback, Running at the Mouth While Running for My Life. Fitz, could you please introduce yourself and let our listeners know just a little about you and your background? Yeah, so I am Fitz Kohler, you got that right, of fitness.com, and I do a few things professionally, which help me do one special thing, which is help folks live better and longer. I'm a fitness expert. I've been teaching around the globe for decades now. I have a master's degree in exercise and sports sciences, and I use my fitness profession. I mainly teach via mass media, so TV, radio, books, magazines, corporate speaking and spokesperson work. However, I can reach a mass amount of people in one fell swoop is where I like to direct my efforts that way. I own one of the largest school running programs in the world. It's called the Morning Mile, and people can find that at morningmile.com. And that's a before school walk and running program that allows every student to participate every day. They get a 30-minute window of time to walk and run. It's simple, stupid, but they can invite their family, the faculty, everyone's involved. And I'm very proud to say my Morning Milers have run millions and millions of miles so far. 
And last but not least, I am a professional race announcer. So I am the voice slash MC host of some of the largest, most prestigious running events in the United States. So Los Angeles Marathon, Buffalo, Big Sur, Philadelphia Marathons, the DC Wonder Woman and Batman series. I man the start and finish line of those events, make sure everyone is engaged, informed, entertained, has a great race, and feels like they won the thing once they've left. Simply incredible. One in eight women get breast cancer. You're a cancer survivor. How did that make you feel the moment you found out that you had cancer? Uh, it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. And a you know, brief synopsis of my story is December of 2018, clean mammogram. I had plenty of annual exams before. I started really young, just under the guise that, golly, if I ever had one cancer cell on my body, I'd like to know about it. So I've been fanatical about early exams of all, uh, annual exams of all sorts, and I've always promoted them. And so December 18, clean mammogram, less than seven weeks later in a hotel bathroom at Disney World, I rubbed my underboob and I felt it. It was a hard bean-like lump and it shouldn't have been there. And so it took me a whopping 30 seconds to pick up the phone and call and make a doctor appointment. I did not hem and haw. I didn't Google it. I didn't cry to my mom or my friends. I pick up the phone and I made the appointment and um, that set forth a rapid series of events that ended up with me starting chemo less than 20 days later, I believe. But uh, it was aggressive and I was aggressive. And that's really the the important story here is that I was one of those one in eight American women, but I saved my own life because I I found it and I reported it quickly. Wow. So what was the hardest part of getting that diagnosis? Um, you know, I it's funny. I, <laughs> I've always identified as being a steely, gritty, sturdy person, fearless. And um, there is no fear and stress like that that comes with cancer. It was absolutely um, terrifying and it, it allowed me to know I was mortal right away. And not only did I feel... For, fear for my own life, but really the major fear was that I wasn't going to get to experience much of my children's lives, Ginger and Parker. And um, it was it was absolutely terrifying. And I really, because I am that girl, you know, I'm the one everyone's like, oh, you're perfect when it comes to fitness. So first of all, I'm not perfect, but I'm a girl who does most of the right things most of the time. So I am exhibit A of healthy lifestyle. And there I was turning into exhibit A of early detection and breast cancer. And I thought for certain I would definitely die simply because I made the perfect tragic tale, you know, perfect. I had the, I was the fitness professional with a great family and the perfect career. And I thought, oh, God, there I go. So um, <laughs> it took a little while to get me to realize I wasn't going to die. And they did have a cure for me. But it was... Um, gut-wrenching, painful. It was, it was a horrible experience. Certainly devastating at the least. Being a person that takes such good care of yourself shows us this can happen to anyone. You advocate doing self-exams. Why is this so important to us? Well, I, you know, it's, I've had my heart broken at the hand of cancer dozens of times. Friends, my dad, two grandmas, you know, I've lost so many wonderful people because of cancer. And I just have always decided I didn't want to go down that way. Um, and I don't want my friends to go down that way either. You know, if I had not found my own lump, if I had waited till the following December to get my annual exam, I'd be dead. It was a fast mover. And if I had waited, you know, by within seven weeks, it was a lump and three infected lymph nodes. If I had waited another 10 and a half months, you know, I'd be gone. So, you know, it's not just breast cancer. It could be any red flags your body shows you. And, and one of the things is that people tend to think they're invincible. It's not going to happen to me. Quite often, they'll find a lump somewhere or they'll have some nagging symptom and they ignore it. They put their head in the sand like an ostrich. And, you know, the fact of the matter is doctors don't creep into your bed at night and lift up the sheets and start looking you over. Oh, look at Ed. He's got a bump here. We're going to we're going to fix that. 
Ed has to make the appointment and say, hey, doc, check me out. See if you find anything wrong or tell me I'm doing great, right? And then you also need to, I've been saying it, you got to squeeze yourself, ladies. You got to put your hand in your shirt. They're your boobs. You have full permission to squeeze them. Guys, you've got testes. You got to squeeze them. You got to look at your skin. Uh, you know, you just have to do it all. And our body will often tell us, hey, something's wrong. We just have to be paying attention. I'm terrified of going to the doctors. Could you walk us through the treatment you received and the worst part of this period in your life? Yeah, so um, terrified of going to the doctor has got to be something you slap yourself out of because the doctor is the thing that'll save your life if you face something. But I did 21 rounds of chemo, 33 rounds of radiation, several surgeries, and my chemo lasted 15 months. Um, the absolute most difficult part was the chemo. The first five months of chemo, they gave me, uh, we nicknamed it the mean chemo, but my doctor said it was the most toxic combination they provide. And it was brutal. It was, you know, it, people think, oh, you're going to be kind of sick and tired and bald. And I was those things, but I wasn't kind of sick. I was violently sick. It was like having a tequila hangover every single day for five months. It was unbearable. And then what's interesting is I did not give up my career as a race announcer. In fact, I chose to be defiant about it. And I just thought, you know what, I have earned my spot on those stages. I am not giving them up and I'm going. So with that nonstop tequila hangover for five months where my stomach was chronically exploding and every, every piece of me was being destroyed from my fingernails to my eyelashes, my vision went bad, everything but I just decided I am not letting this thing get the best of me. And so with that, I got on 22 flights, flew to 22 different locations, hosted 22 major events and probably half a million athletes. And it was awesome. <laughs> it was really, really hard. But looking back, I'm really proud and uh, grateful that I committed to doing that. That segues right into our next question. How did you keep working and keep all of the obligations that you had during this time frame? Yeah, so good questions. When I was home, um, once my doctor realized how sick I was going to be, he put me on a regimen of I'd have chemo on a Monday. It was every three weeks, usually on Mondays. He would have me come in for IV fluids every weekday after that. And so we got creative while I was on the road. I reached out to my race directors and said, hey, I'm going to be there and I'm going to perform as expected, but I need a little help and organize some sort of situation for me to get uh, IV fluid drips. It was pretty interesting. We, we had to go through a lot of effort to keep me up on my feet. Um, the good news is once I got onto my stages, I was filled with, we, I, you know, I call it runner fueled adrenaline where it was almost like uh, my on switch was struck. So it, even if I spent the night on the bath hotel bathroom floor the night before, because of being sick, I would get up, putting on my running shoes and my pants. And mind you, I wasn't running. I was just running at the mouth. I'm talking all the day. But um, I would get on my stage and zing! It was as though I was full fit, full force Fitz Kohler again. And I got to be lively and energetic. And, and what was a great gift was turning my attention from myself to, to all of my athletes. And I, I really got to forget about me for a while. And it was pretty special. During this time period in which you had cancer, what was the best advice or the best help that you received? Um, I, you know, I didn't get a lot of advice. I think my good decisions came from within, but I really did have a lot of wonderful support. I mean, when I had to create or I decided to create a little video announcing that I had breast cancer. I would have actually kept the whole ordeal private if I could have. But knowing I was going to stand on stage as bald after having two feet of hair for my whole life, I thought people would ask questions. So I, I make this video and, you know, I told people, I said, listen, I have breast cancer. I'm going to be fine. It's going to be difficult, but, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I expect no pity. You can root for me. You can pray for me, but no pity. And I'll accept your well wishes. And, you know, <laughs> here I go type thing. Um, but the world dumped love on me with kind messages. People sent gift cards for restaurants. You know, I have two kids. I, I, I do have a husband, but he works full time. And, you know, things like feeding my children became 
a big deal. You know, getting them safe rides to and from school became a very big deal. And um, so as far as the things that mattered most to me, I think feeding and driving my children were some of the greatest gifts I've received. And uh, my husband did everything you could imagine. I mean, he took me to all of the scary appointments and, um, you know, anything I needed, he provided. And I can tell you some days when I was really in bad shape, if he didn't bring me a drink, I wouldn't have had a drink. So it was really special to have him there um, just doing anything and everything he could to keep me healthy. And then when I was traveling, my friends, my race community, they were bringing me snacks and drinks. And I actually almost passed out on a stage in July in Denver. So it was 100 degrees and I was a mile high in the sky, which I'm no good at elevation because I'm a Floridian. And I had just had my sixth and final round of the really mean chemo. And I was on my stage with Wonder Woman, mind you. So at the DC Wonder Woman run series, Warner Brothers sends out their, their Wonder Woman. And she's gorgeous and, you know, amazing. And so I'm standing at next to her with about 10,000 athletes surrounding me doing my thing. And then all of a sudden, Denver starts spinning. And it starts turning yellow. And I think, oh, no, don't pass out, don't pass out, don't pass out. And then I looked at at the ground around my stage. Sometimes my stage is on grass, which is nice. This day it was not on grass. And then I saw the concrete below the stage and I thought, oh, no, don't break bones, don't break bones. And just, you know, sometimes people, it's the right person at the right time. But our um, sound and video engineer, Kent, he just happened to be bringing me a drink and a snack to my stage. This was not his job. He was not snack guy. He just randomly decided he was going to take care of me in case I needed it. And um, I, I put the microphone down and I started drinking and eating and the world stopped spinning. And that was just a magical little bit of support that came out of the blue and really saved us from a very difficult day. Yeah, thank God for good people. So could you tell us, what was it like for you to lose your hair in the first place? And also, I noticed when you started growing your hair back, you started naming your hairs. Could you walk us through that? Yeah, so I I can definitely say sometimes people mean well, they, they're meaning well trying to lighten a, a difficult situation. Oh, it's just hair. Well, I, I agree that my hair was a fair exchange for my life, but it's not just hair. And if it was just hair, we'd all just shave our head every day and be bald. So um, it was gut-wrenching, the thought of losing it. And then when the it started falling out, Oh, it was very, very painful. And mine decided to fall out in very dramatic fashion while I was on stage at the Los Angeles Marathon, which is my largest event of the year. I have 25,000 athletes out on the course and I'm manning the finish line and my black stage was covered with two feet of long blonde hair everywhere. So that was tough and um, yielded many tears. Although I was able to do my job, nobody knew what was going on other than my um, announcing partner, Rudy, but came home and shaved it, which was difficult. I sat at my kitchen table with my family and my stylist, Kristen, came over. And what we did is we separated my hair into two braids, chopped them off, and my children have them. They asked for them. And I thought, sure, if this is what you want, you can have it. So I was sad. Being bald was weird. Um, I could, it was cold. You know, I never wore a wig. I would only wear hats if, you know, I were out in the sunshine or it it was cold outside. Um, So it was definitely unusual getting used to. I had a dark tan line on the top of my head because I always parted my hair in the middle. So I had like a skunk stripe from my forehead to the crown of my head, which was weird. Um, And then when it started coming back in, it's amazing you can be so happy for so little or so grateful for so little. And so, yeah, I had the first piece of hair came right dead center, top of my head. And it was just one piece. It grew overnight. It was maybe, I don't know, half an inch of hair. And I thought, oh, there it is. So I called it alfalfa, which is, you know, perfect for many reasons. But I did have that one alfalfa mm-hmm. hair coming out of the top of my head. And so I showed my kids and I, I'm sure I took a picture and shared it online. Look, I've got alfalfa. And then um, 
a couple days later, Ginger was like, oh my God, mom, you have a ponytail. And it was one rogue hair coming out of the back of my head where a ponytail would start. And it was possibly two inches long. And, uh, you know, I could have trimmed it because it was weird. And instead, I thought I would take out Falfa and and I named her Lolita because she was long and sexy and girly. And um, I made them role models for the rest of my head. So I had Alfalfa and Lolita for quite a while. And um, it was awesome. And then the hair started coming back in a little patchy. And at that point, Ed, I got to tell you, I didn't care. I just thought, oh, I'm getting hair and this is cool. And um, I, I, I definitely have enough hair that it qualifies kind of as girl hair now. And I, I have it into two little ponytails. It's still weird. I wake up every morning and it stands up tall like Albert Einstein. <laughs> and it's bleach blonde, so I definitely look like a nutty professor. But um, it's awesome. I love having hair. And I'm grateful for all the little weird step. That is so wonderful. After surviving cancer, could you tell us how did it feel for you to walk up and finally get a ring that survivor bell? Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, you, you go through phases with cancer. So it's, I had the main chemo and then I had surgery and during the surgery, they removed the cancerous tumor and, uh, 11 lymph nodes and they tested all the surrounding lymph nodes to make sure they had clear margins. So it was a few, maybe a month or so after surgery, I asked my radiology oncologist, I said, Dr. Hayes, when do I become in remission? She said, you're cancer free. <laughs> so that was one of those moments where I was like, oh, okay. Well, that was kind of anticlimactic, but um, I did ring that I had radiation, uh, those 33 rounds, and I really didn't have a terrible time with radiation. That was a, a fairly easy part of treatment for me. I had mild burning, nothing too severe. So um, they have the bell ringing ceremony for that. Now, every cancer facility works it differently they have different celebration mechanisms. But when I finished up with radiation, we had a, a big bell ringing and I woke up that morning thinking it wasn't going to be too big of a deal. But yeah, I actually was really excited thinking, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm done. I don't know. You know, I didn't anticipate that part meaning so much to me. Um, but I, I was really proud and where I hadn't brought my children to any cancer appointments previously, because I didn't want to bring them into stressful or scary moments. I did allow them to come to the bell ringing and it was just really fun. My daughter and I did a dance, a TikTok dance in front of the radiation machine. And that was pretty cool. And that got went viral on social media, which was kind of neat. And then at the very end of chemo, so chemo was really the, the bear for me. I had 15 months of it. And when I finished my final chemo, um, they had a little, they have a little poster that says, you know, done with chemo on this date, something to that effect. And they play at a very low level on the stereo, um, Cool in the Gang Celebration. And it, and the stereo has a little disco ball on top. So it speckles colorful lights on the ceiling. Now, mind you, it is the quietest celebration ever. But for 15 months, I had been watching many other patients finish up their chemo. And I started feeling like, wow, I really can't wait for my own um, little disco party. And sadly, because of COVID, I couldn't even have my husband come in with me for that one. So it was just basically me alone. <sighs> it finally felt like I was done. You know, it was incredible. I came home and all the neighbors walked up my street. I live on a hill. So they were all climbing the hill to get to me with their signs. And it was that point where I buckled over in tears and it just you know, the, the whole experience would finally be done. So I'm, I'm grateful to be alive that it, it wasn't a guarantee. That's wonderful. So could you share with our listeners what made you decide to write a book and share your journey with the whole world to see? Also, what would be the target audience for this book? Another good question. So um, I was inspired to write it for a couple of reasons. Number one, as I was going through it, I kept thinking, why did nobody warn me about this? Nobody tells you these things. And I, I just, I couldn't figure out why nobody actually ever tells the truth about what really goes on. And then when my 
accumulation of side effects hit the fans so seriously and they became absurd, I started to laugh about it. And I thought, you know what? People might get a really good laugh at this. Um, and I've always found with my presentations on fitness and sports that if I can make the room laugh, then they stay really engaged in the message because they're looking for the next laugh. So I thought, wow, people would probably really enjoy hearing about this. So number one, getting into the gory details because nobody does. And, and I can tell you that once I was completed with my book, I went out and I checked out a few books at a library, women uh, memoirs from a few famous people. And while the memoirs are very nice, they reveal almost nothing. So as far as I know right now, I'm one of the only people who's told all the juicy, gory details. And the cancer patients and survivors that are reading it now unanimously come back and say, I wish I had it when I was diagnosed. That's one thing. And then the other thing that really inspired me to write the book is the fact that when cancer care collided with my profession, things went haywire in a very interesting way. And there was just so many interesting, exciting stories to tell. I could have very easily titled the book Adventures in Breast Cancer. Um, but yeah, I think from what I, the feedback I get from other people, because it doesn't really matter what I think about the book, is they tell me it's very informative and it's a tremendous message of hope and perseverance. And I think when people get diagnosed with cancer, they start looking for two things, information and hope. And then last but not least, I think the running community will certainly get a great kick out of it because I bring them behind the scenes on what it's like to do what I do for these gargantuan events. And uh, they really enjoy learning a little bit of that. So do you feel that the book met your expectations? Yeah. Yeah, I'm very proud of the book. I mean, I, I, I'm i someone who only writes or I only get on a stage when I have something specific to say. You know, I'm not someone you can hire to write an article. I don't work that way. I only write or speak when I have something valuable to say. And I, I really think these pages are filled with funny stories, raw stories, a lot of good advice, perspective. I, I think there's hopefully... Hopefully the reader will enjoy the book. I hear it's a page turner, but hopefully they walk away a little bit of a better person because of it. Okay. Could you tell our listeners, what's the message you want people to take away from this book? That they're responsible for their own health. That, you know, A, health matters. It matters what you put in your mouth. It matters the way you move your body, where you sleep, whether you deal with quality people or cranky people. So you are responsible for your health. And if I can be diagnosed with cancer, as you said it from the start, anybody can be diagnosed with cancer or something else. So it's better to prepare your body to do battle right now. And I assure you that going into any sort of illness or injury, you will recover and rebound far more quickly and easily if you are fit and strong to begin with. If you go into crisis already in a weak or sickly state, you may not make it out. So um, health matters. And too many people are focused on their swimsuit body. If you want to look great in a swimsuit and you can do that, great for you. But it's not about that. It's about living long, living well, and being resilient. And I think people who, uh, who go from point A to B in my book will have that kick in the can and hopefully start doing better for themselves and they will squeeze their stuff. So that leads us right into my next question. How important is everyday exercise? Also, how much exercise per day should we be getting? So I like to let people choose, but you know, understand that the way our body was designed with our joints, our ball and socket joints, our hinge joints, our body was designed to move. It wasn't designed to sit down. We have 164 hours in a week. So on occasion, someone will say, you should do three 30-minute workouts per week. Okay, well, that's 90 minutes out of 164 hours. If you're not specifically exercising or being active, more than likely you're sitting in a chair, driving, eating, reading, working, or you're lying flat sleeping. So we do lots and lots and lots of sitting and sleeping. I think 90 minutes out of 164 hours, maybe not enough. Now, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to run a marathon. But I think a good, solid hour of deliberate exercise per day 
is a minimum. And when I say exercise, that's not mowing a lawn. Exercise is deliberate. You've put on your running shoes or your swimsuit or your sports bra, and you've gone out to huff and puff or get stronger, stretch, train your balance. You know, it's deliberate exercise. I also want you to be active. I want you to clean your house and I want you to garden, but I want you to also deliberately exercise. And uh, so choose wisely. And then you have to watch what you put in your body. You know, your exercise determines whether you are strong and athletic and have great cardiorespiratory abilities. However, your eating habits and drinking habits determine your size. And if you're overweight, you're usually a little more likely to end up with things like diabetes and heart disease and cancer. So your weight actually does matter. Um, if you are struggling with your weight, on the cover of my website, it's called fitness.com. There's an article called The Exact Formula for Weight Loss, and it will help you achieve your ideal weight by learning how to eat the right amount of the right food for the size you want to be. I am completely opposed to diets, pills, powders, supplements, wraps, any of this snake oil. Fitness isn't complicated. You really do have to decide what size you want to be. That formula will give you a caloric budget. And then you just stick to that and you try to eat more healthy foods than unhealthy foods. Um, so very simple, stupid on that. but you should be able to achieve your ideal weight um, moving forward without problem. And I can tell you that everybody's capable of losing weight because if you stranded anybody at sea, they would lose weight. And so um, you can do this. It just requires, yeah, it requires a little bit of strength and discipline, math, science. And I, and I lay that out for people quite simply. As far as exercise goes, you know, frequency and intensity matters, but variety matters too to make your heart and lung strong, um, your muscles strong, all of them, not just your arms or not just your legs, all your muscles matter. So do your best to be well-rounded. You don't have to run if you don't like to run. You can dance, you can paddleboard, you can do karate, whatever it is that suits you probably will move you towards that finish line. So could you tell us what got you started in this sort of lifestyle and how early in your life did this sort of behavior begin? So I'm, I'm fortunate. I grew up in a very athletic family. We were always in one sport or another. I, I did everything in elementary school alone, from t-ball to soccer, cheerleading, speed skating, you name it, I did it. I was never a great athlete, but I was a kid who always participated in sports. When I was 14, I got tackled playing soccer ended up with an MCL tear and a variety of cartilage, ligament, tendon damage, had major surgery. And I thought during the physical therapy process that, wow, I'd like to be a physical therapist. This is a great job. I liked the gym atmosphere. I liked helping people. Um, but then the PT uh, ended up touching my incision. And I thought, that's disgusting. I could not touch somebody else's incision because I'm squeamish. Um, so I left PT and went over, I joined a gym. My mom lied and said that I was 15. So I could join the gym and, uh, I thought the aerobics instructors were cool. I liked their leotard. I liked taking classes. And so while I was still 15, I applied for a job there and the manager was real low key. He said, well, you know, have you ever taught fitness before? And I said, no. He said, all right, well, you want to come in on Friday night and try teaching a class? Thankfully, I'm a gamer. So I said, uh, sure. So I started teaching in that gym and fell in love with it. I loved helping people. I love sports and fitness and music. And then when I came up to the University of Florida, I was teaching at their gym, but I took the summer off to work on a cruise ship. And so I sailed across the Atlantic to um, Russia and every country in Scandinavia. And I had a wonderful time working with a variety of people on that ship and off the ship. And then when I came back to Gainesville uh, for more college, I auditioned for a TV show and ended up landing a role teaching on television. And that, that really was a pivot point where I was introduced to mass audiences and I would meet strangers who would tell me that they loved the show and I had helped them lose so much weight. And I really thought, wow, this is a powerful tool for me. I liked helping strangers. You know, it's, it's one thing to be in a classroom and um, teach exercise to 50 people. It's a completely different beast to be able to be on a television three times a week and help thousands 
of people at a time. Um, so I fell in love with mass media, writing articles, speaking to corporations, speaking for corporations. So anytime I can get it, get on a stage on a microphone, I do it. Well, you sure are an inspiration to a lot of people. So if people want to hire you for a speaking engagement or to announce their race, how would they contact you to get involved with you? Oh, thank you for asking. So I'm always available at fitness.com. That's F-I-T-Z-N-E-S-S.com. There's a contact fits form on there, but I'm always going to be at fitness.com. And it's a great wealth of information right there as well. And then I'm on social media on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at fitness. Uh, so yeah, and I really enjoy it when people reach out, if they say, Hey, I heard you on the dead America podcast. I would love that. So um, reach me at fitness.com or fitness on social media. Well, I would love that if they reached out and said they found you on dead America podcast. It was a great time with you and i do thank you fitz for being with us today of course thank you so much ed i really appreciate the opportunity thank you for joining us today if you found this podcast enlightening entertaining educational in any way please share like subscribe and join us right back here next week for another great episode of Dead America Podcast. I'm Ed Waters, your host. Enjoy your afternoon, wherever you may be.